Okay, we're back with part two of the story of the Love and Spoonful. So last we left you, uh, it was early 1966. The band were the darlings of pop music, and they had several hits under their belt. But things took a turn in May 1966 in San Francisco, where Zal Yanofsky and Steve Boone were busted for marijuana. Now, this wouldn't normally be too big of a deal. Uh, back in those days, you, there were stiff penalties, but since Zal was Canadian, uh, he could be deported. Now, what was discussed and decided upon very quickly was that the record company, uh, Kama Sutra, and their management, they did not want to stop the money train rolling. And with Zali potentially being deported, that would mess things up a bit. So what they decided to do was, because what they were being asked was to name their dealer. They could get off if they did that. So they, they figured, well, let's do that, and we're going to put our resources behind uh, to, to defend the dealer so he can, we can get him off. So that was the plan, but the problem was, was the counterculture, which was, you know, the nascent counterculture press at this time, did not take too kindly to that. So the counterculture magazines and press, such as the Los Angeles Free Press, took out ads saying do not buy the band's records, do not go to their shows, things like that. That was a big problem for them. Uh, their fans nationwide, I don't know if everybody knew about this because when they went in to record their next album is when they had their first number one hit. So it didn't seem to affect them too much on the pop charts. And that song was Summer in the City. Hot town, summer in the city, back of my neck getting dirt and gritty. Great song. Number one in Canada, United States, big hit in England. This album is also considered possibly one of the best albums. Okay, they had two follow-ups to Summer in the City, two big hits, which were Nashville Cats and Rain on the Roof. Nashville Cats, play clean as country water. Maggie will be caught for hours, waiting out the sun. Now, one other song I like to mention on here is a song called Coconut Grove, which uh, is one of my favorite songs by them and one of their most acclaimed early voyages into psychedelia. Softly she will speak the stars until sun So despite being one of the biggest hits and having the first number one song, the bust that they had uh, endured really had an effect on the band's psyche. So John Sebastian, earlier on, had said, you know, I need you guys to support me a little more. I can't do all the writing. You guys gonna help me write. So Boone and Yanofsky were doing some writing. But after the bust, uh, Steve Boone had mentioned that he, he just had some writer's block in, in the, the black cloud that followed them because of the bust really affected their product, productivity. Nonetheless, they did another film soundtrack, this time for Francis Ford Coppola. This was his second film called You're a Big Boy Now. They also do some instrumentals on here, but the, there was a big hit off this record called Darling Be Home Soon. So darling be home soon I couldn't bear to wait an extra minute. Two other vocals on this album that are really top notch are Girl, Beautiful Girl and You're a Big Boy Now. Hey. So this, like all the preceding albums, were pro was produced by Eric Jacobson. And the two soundtrack albums I consider to be essential parts of their catalog. There's some really excellent tracks on both. Now the band had re-signed a new contract with Kama Sutra, and, um, which had a focus on singles. But all the problems up to this point started to culminate and started to get even bigger. I mentioned, obviously, the bust was breaking up the band a little bit, and they were struggling writing, and they were their hits were starting to fall off a little bit by this point as well. Now, another problem in the band had to do with, it wasn't a musical thing, uh, but it was a, a woman. And according to Eric Jacobson, uh, Zalyanovsky uh, had been seeing this woman who they ended that relationship, and then she began seeing John Sebastian. Now, this made matters a little bit, it made some tension within the band. Yanovsky, at this point, he was always the goofy guy who was always 
cracking people up on stage and doing these crazy sta stage antics. And he started to do this to a point that was irritating the band a little bit more. He didn't like where Sebastian's songwriting was going. He felt that John Sebastian's songs were getting far too much about John, uh, for instance, Darling Be Home Soon. And he wanted to go back to the old club days and have that kind of a, uh, a lifestyle, I guess. And I guess, you know, there isn't really any going back when you get to a certain point. The other thing that was going on at this time was their, uh, Bob Cavallo, who was their manager, thought that Eric Jacobson was fooling around with his wife. So there was talk about firing Zali because of the problems he was bringing to the band. He was just not, he seemed interested in being with the band anymore and unhappy with the, with the direction of the writing. So Jacobson went to Sebastian and said, look, we can't fire Zali. I mean, that's, are you crazy? So the manager, uh, Cavallo and Sebastian decided, well, if we're gonna fire Zali, might as well fire Jacobson too. So both of those guys got the ax at the same time. So the decision to fire Zali was really a band decision and there was a meeting between the four guys and I think Steve Boone was the guy that had to give deliver the bad news. But it, it wasn't that strange because Zal was present during the next album. So the next album, we're into 1967 here, and the replacement for Zali was Jerry Yester. And if you remember, he was the guy that was on the first album playing keyboards and doing some arranging. He had done some production with the association and he had uh, done a couple solo singles on his own as well. He joined the band as a permanent member at this time. And uh, even though Zali was no longer a member of the band, Zali still hung around the shows here and there, went to some of these sessions on this next album, Everything's Playing. I don't know if Zali played on the sessions, but he was present at some of the sessions. Now this album was difficult because Jacobson was gone and Joe Wissert was the new producer and this is the first time a, a rock band recorded on a 16 track recorder. And this proved problematic for the producer. The band was being difficult. The producer ended up walking out. So basically the band had to produce themselves and Jerry Yester was the one who kind of saved this album. Now this record is, came out after Sgt. Pepper and it's, it's got some pepperish um, influence on it, particularly with the single, She's Still a Mystery. And she One of the other songs of note is called Younger Generation. And although I wouldn't call it psychedelic, it does mention the use of LSD. This album is generally considered a psychedelic album. And for those of you pop psych fans, I would highly recommend this record. Aside from the psychedelic uh, She's Still a Mystery, the other real psychedelic song on here is called Only Pretty, What a Pity. And that's a, uh, that was written by Jerry Esther and Joe Butler. And then Jerry Esther chipped in with his own song called Close Your Eyes, which was co-written by John Sebastian. And I must be permissive, understanding of the younger generation. This album is considered to be a pretty good album, though it doesn't have that fun, good time, jug band feel that earlier records did. Uh, that's replaced with some psychedelic flourishes, which works in some areas, in some areas it doesn't work, but generally it's a pretty good album. This record hit the charts early 1968. It was released in December of 67. But by early 68, John Sebastian had decided to leave the band and that dark cloud of the San Francisco bus from 1966 was still hovering over the band. I think Sebastian figured that the name Love and Spoonful was just a mark on him and he probably felt he had to get out to continue his career. So he left the band at this point, and, but the band continued on. So we have the next album, Revelation Revolution 69. So <laughs> kind of an interesting cover here. We have Joe Butler, it says featuring Joe Butler. So. 
One of the things that I never liked about this record was that the positioning of Joe Butler above everybody else in the band. And when the drummer starts taking lead, you know things are kind of near the end, I suppose. But this record isn't horrible. The very first single from this album didn't chart at all, and that was the song called Till I Run With You. That was supposed to be the name of the album. But since that, al that song bombed so badly, they didn't go with that as the name of the album. They changed it to Revelation, Revolution 69. So this album picks up where the last album leaves off uh, with that psychedelic type of uh, production. And they make some, some very bad missteps on this album. There's an album, a song called War Games, which is essentially like, if you want to call it their version of Revolution 9. It's not any good at all. Seven minutes, two seconds. Uh, you'll never get the time back if you listen to that song. But there are some good songs on here. The song Till I Run With You is a solid song. And the song Revelation, Revolution 69 is the song that probably should have been the single off here. It reminds me a little bit of those late period Paul Revere and the Raiders songs. So because we had no John Sebastian on this album, they had to rely on some outside writers. And one of the, the last hit song, uh, the last charting song anyway, is a, call, a song called Me About You by Bonner and Gordon. They're famous for having written Happy Together. Me About You was covered by other bands as well. Nobody could quite have a hit with it. And these guys were able to hit number 91 with it only. It hit number 70 in Canada, but only 91 here in the States. And after this, album was done they pretty much hung it up and that was the end of the band so even though the band was no more kama sutra was not done with them uh, you may recall that the Woodstock Festival that happened in August of 1969, John Sebastian made a memorable appearance there, warming up the crowd, doing a few songs on his acoustic guitar. One of those songs was Younger Generation. He's shown in the film. So when the film came out in early 1970, Kama Sutra released the single by the Love and Spoonful of Younger Generation, hoping that might garner some interest, but it did not. It missed the charts entirely. So that was really the end of their uh, the band and their releases. Now, one of the things that if you're an album collector and looking to get some best ofs on vinyl, uh, this is their first greatest hits. This came out in early 67 and a volume two came out, out not long after that. And I always like these because they have the cartoon drawings of the band, which are kind of fun. This would be a good place to start as any if you're looking to get into this band. There are also plenty of CD compilations that are really comprehensive that you can find as well. That is the story of the Love and Spoonful. And even though they didn't have a masterpiece album, they left behind a really solid body of work. Any of these albums are worth getting and worth listening to. And you'll be able to hear why their contemporaries rated them so highly. Don't forget to like, share, and comment below. There'll be plenty more videos coming from Pop Goes the 60s. See you next time.